why don't we turn in our Bible to 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 18 here this morning. We're going to be talking about decisions. You ever have troubles making make decisions? Yeah, and what Joel talks about how as he looked back at this period of time as being in a valley of decisions. Like you ever get there where you're stuck in the mud and you can't decide what you're supposed to do? Well, I think we make decisions all the time, don't we? Especially um, this past week with our, our whole nation trying to make a decision who's going to be in the Supreme Court or not. Oh, my goodness, wasn't that something? And people make decisions on who they're going to marry. There's people making decisions even this day, how sad, how, how it is, is if they're going to stay married or not. Pray for the marriages of the churches, the you know, people who are making decisions even not right now. Of course, then there's people that got to make decisions uh, where they're going to go to school. We don't have to make that decision right now, do we? You know, and but as parents, you do all that and you decide. Uh, we got to make a decision where we're, when we're going to go to Tyler, Texas. Are we going to leave tonight or tomorrow morning? Is I got to take my dogs, and not my dogs, my boys' dogs, to Tyler this week? Because Robert and Erica are now living in Tyler, Texas. And so we're going to leave and take them. So decisions are so much part of our life. In 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 24, it says, and, and call ye on the name of your gods. And I will call on the name of our Lord and the God that answers by fire. Let him be God. And all the people answered said, it is well spoken. So you have here on Mount Carmel is where you're at. And just to refresh you where you're at on your Bible map, if you go to Jerusalem, you go over to the coast, and you head up north, and you find a mountain range there by the Mediterranean, and there sits Mount Carmel, where this takes place. And right there in Mount Carmel, when you go over to a cliff, you look down in this valley, and this huge valley is known as the Jezreel Valley, also known in future times as what? is the battle where the battle of Armageddon is going to take pl place. And the one thing that's really interesting when you're on Mount Carmel, you look across that valley and you see the city of Nazareth across the way. You know who grew up there? Jesus did. Can you picture that, that Jesus standing there working his whole life there, looking down at this valley, the valley of Armageddon, that it's going to be the future battle of the war, war, I mean, world as he looked at that. But in our time, the time, they're there on Mount Carmel. Like I said, there's three groups, but really four groups. Of course, first we have in our story of Elijah, the lone prophet standing for Jehovah. You might feel like that sometimes, like you're the lone ranger, especially in our day's world where it seems like everybody's against us. But he stood for Jehovah, the true and living God. Then there was 400 prophets of Baal. Do you remember what the first commandment was for Israel, what Moses gave them? He says, you should have no other gods before me. Yet here, there's 450 prophets of Baal strong, standing strong, rebellion against, rebellion against the Lord is it, just going on throughout the land. At this time, it's amazing where, where they're at is that now up in the hill countries outside of Jerusalem is now they've gotten up in the hillsides. They built these altars and these groves throughout the land, and especially in the northern kingdom, that's just filled with these other gods where they were starting to worship. Yet there's 450 standing strong, leading others to turn others away from God to worship this false god of Baal. The third crowd, of course, is the indecisive crowd. The indecisive decisive crowd who want to serve both Jehovah and Baal. You know, they still want to serve the world, but yet they want to serve God. And now, of course, the true service of God, which always seems to be in the minority, the ones who are sold out for Jesus Christ, they, of course, they're always not only in the, the minority, the false prophets are, are there who oppose the things of God even today. Uh, the false prophets are opposed to the things of God. I think of the ACLU and, 
and certainly Hollywood and the movie industry that does everything that oppose the things of Christianity, not only that, the liberal media, the liberal, and, and they do the things that oppose the things of God. This isn't anything new that we're experiencing today. It was during the time of Elijah, and it was during these uh, times of these prophets of Israel that, that have turned their lives over to Baal, and they were trying to serve two masters. Can you picture that? What did Jesus say about this? In Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, Jesus said that, that no man could serve two ma masters, for he will hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and what? And mammon. You cannot have your feet in both places. But yet, in spite of that, there are those who are living this way today. There's those who will want to live for God and go to church on Sunday, but they're so concerned about their zip code where they live. It says, you know, they spend their time striving. I got to live by the water. I got to live up on the mountains. I got to, and their life is filled with the what? As Jesus talked about, the cares of the world. Rather than living for God day in and day out and selling out for the Lord, people are on the fence trying to have enough of the Lord. And just enough to escape the judgment of God, you know, the judgment of hell, really. In 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 30, he says, They fear the Lord and worship their own God. That doesn't make sense, does it? They fear the Lord, but still worship their own gods. Really, it's a plural sense. You know, they had name for the gods back then. We have names for the gods today. We just don't call them that, though. Though then We don't call them gods. But they want to do this, and they follow after their, their gods, unless something happens, right? Unless real trouble happens. And when trouble comes knocking on the door, all of a sudden, they're willing to pick up the phone and say, Pastor, Pastor, could you help me? Could you pray for me? Could you do something for me? I'm in trouble. And they're willing to repent for their short time, for their short period. But yet they find themselves going back living for their gods of this world. And this is where they were even in Judges chapter 10, verse 13. He, says, he said, you have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore, I will deliver you no more. Go cry unto the gods which you have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your distress. You know, they, they were seeking the nation of Israel to play both sides of the fence. Elijah was coming, calling them really on the carpet, wasn't he? He says, you need to make a decision. Either you're going to serve God or not. And I think that isn't that a fair thing that God would ask us here this morning? Are we going to sell out for the Lord? Are we going to live for the Lord day in and day out? Or are we going to play Christianity? There, I think there's a difference between the religion of Christian of Christians and the person of Jesus Christ. The person of Jesus Christ is what Christianity is all about. And it's a day in and day out. I find in my life there's no vacation from Jesus. There's no time out. Like, okay, Lord, well, I had enough of you today. i got to go do my own thing. But really in our lifestyles, I think a lot of times we do that. Monday morning, okay, God, i got to go figure out my, my work schedule. i got to go figure out my life. i got to, you know, because we leave God out of the equation. So in essence, what we're doing, we're putting Jesus up on the shelf, and we're trying to do it ourselves, not living for the Lord, playing a dangerous game with God and gambling with their eternal destiny. They seem to forget that God said that his spirit will not always strive with man. The prophet Jeremiah said something very interesting. In Jeremiah chapter 14, verse 11, he says, Then the Lord said to me, Pray not for the good of those, uh, for the, these people when they fast, I will not hear their cry. And when they offer burnt offering and an oblation, I will not accept them, but I will consume them by the sword and by famine and by pestilence. He says, don't even pray for them. That's a terrible place, isn't it? When people have so rebelled against the Lord, 
fact, Hosea, God said to Hosea, Ephraim has joined to her idols, let her alone. In Hosea chapter 4, verse 17, he says, join, they become one like a husband and wife. They no longer are following the things of the Lord. See, God is underneath no obligation to serve you. He owes you nothing. He owes me nothing. In the book of Hebrews, so often we think this is just for the Old Testament people. But in the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews, we get the same thing. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26, listen to this, what he says. For if we go on sinning willfully after we have received the knowledge of true truth, he says, if we're willing to continue in sin like the nation of Israel had continued in their lifestyle after receiving the knowledge of truth, there remains no sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking for the judgment and fire in the nation which shall be devour the adversary God. Those that despised Moses' law were put to death without mercy when two or three would witness them against them. How much worse do you suppose that the punishment shall be for those who had trodden underneath the foot of the Son of God and had counted the blood of, covenant, the, of the covenant on a holy thing and had not despised the spirit of grace? For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongs to me. This is exactly, or that's exactly where many are today. They, they wanted to know God, and they wanted to follow the Lord, but some way or another, they thought they, it was just okay to show up on Sunday. But yet here in the New Testament, it tells us if we're, willing to, if we're going to continue in our sin, if we're sinning willfully, that's what it tells us in Hebrew. That's what was happening to the nation of Israel. They were making a willful choice to sin. And Elijah is saying, it's time to choose. Are you going to serve the Lord or not? I think it's so sad when he says, he, the writer of Hebrews, where it says, you have trodden underneath the foot of the Son of God. How did they trodden underneath the foot of the Son of God? When they received the truth of God, they ignored it. They, they took their truth and started believing an error that they could continue in their lifestyle, and they didn't need to repent and so thus they've taken the truth of God and making it as like what it says here, a, a really despicable things. You are in a fearful place. The writer of Hebrews, it tells us, the cry of the prophet Elijah, it tells us in verse 21 of chapter 18, he says, how long will thou halt between two opinions? If Jehovah is God, then serve him. If Baal is God, then serve him. Him. It's like he's drawing a line right in the sand, isn't he? Isn't that what he's doing to us this morning? Is God God? What's your answer to that this morning? Do you believe the God of the Bible? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Is Jesus your Lord? And then if what Elijah was saying, then we need to serve him. The story, I, of course, took, long, took place a long time ago. But people with divided hearts are still standing in this valley of decision. They're right there. What are they going to do? How are they going to react to the things of this world? Elijah is asking them how long are they going to stand there. It's interesting in 1 John what it says. It tells us to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And that's chapter 2, verse 15. In James 4, 4, it says, You adulterous and adul uh, adulterous, know you not that a friendship of the world is what? Enmity with God. And whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Pretty clear to me that there's a choice. If we're loving this world and the things of this world, then John tells us and James tells us that you're not loving God and you shouldn't fool yourself. So how do you know if you're truly loving God? I think that's a fair question here this morning. And it really comes to as a self-examination. 
the Bible tells us that we should examine ourselves to see if we be in the faith. Otherwise, take it a time out. You know, I remember it was a, your kids growing up, and now I think the kids want to tell me, say, Dad, take a time out for a second, right? You know, you tell your kids, take a time out for a moment. But the Bible tells us that we should take a time out to examine ourselves, to see if we be in the faith. And Elijah is calling him on the carpet and say, take a time out. And the way that you know if you are walking with God is to answer yourself, what truly is your master passion of your life? What drives you? What do you, each and every day, what are the things that you serve? Is Jehovah, is Jehovah your God? We sang about it this morning. What a beautiful time of worshiping uh, as we were serving, uh, singing about them and years gone by, worshiping Jehovah in the temple. Well, the question is, are we worshiping Jehovah? We worship God today in our temple. The Bible tells you, know you not what? That you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells in us and that we should be worshiping him. And we will be worshiping God in the future tense. I mean, the future life around the throne of God. Is he your master, master passion and serve him? If Baal is your God, the master passion of his life, then serve him is really what he's saying. Paul writes in Romans chapter 6, verse 16, he says, Know you not that whom you yield yourself is servants to obey, his servants you become, whether to sin unto death or to obedience unto righteousness. And so you hear this theme throughout the Bible. The Bible doesn't have that many topics or themes. They just get repeated over and over because I think, as Jesus says, we're like sheep, right? We, we take, it takes us a little bit to understand. And so Paul's telling us the same thing. Who are you going to follow? If you follow the commandments of God, if you wanted to follow the Lord, then serve him. If you follow the suggestions of Satan, which is Baal, and he's your passion, then you become the servants of who? You become the servant of Satan. I don't think anybody would like to say that. You know, today, I'm a Christian. Well, what are you doing in your life? Well, I like to go out, you know, I go to church on Sunday, Saturday night, I end up partying, but it's okay. I just go have, have a few drinks. Well, according to my Bible, if you're living that life, then you, you're really a servant of Baal. You're really a servant of Satan. Don't fool yourself. How long will you halt between two opinions? Elijah asked them, how long will you be sitting on the fence? Jesus said, he that is not for me is against me. Elijah proposed the con a contest between Jehovah and Baal in our story. He built two altars. I love that. He built two altars. 450 prophets build their altar to Baal, and I will build an altar unto the Lord. You'll put your sacrifice on your altar. Can you picture these guys? This is going to be good. Put your sacrifice on your altar, and, and whoever could, altars consume with fire, sacrifice with fire, you, I mean, then we're going to worship that guy. You know what Baal's actually, na uh, the name of that God means to us? He means he's the God of the sun. And he says, the God of the sun, certainly you guys must have power to be able to come down and consume your sacrifice with fire, the sun God. And the altar was built by Elijah. He, and of course, they chose what bullocks they wanted. Notice in verse 27, after these guys had been trying this all day, these 450, they were going out, they were, you know, chanting, they were singing their songs as they were cutting themselves. They were doing everything they could to be able to get the God, their son God to come down and consume him. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them. <laughs> I kind of like this. Pastor Oden and I were talking before service about our time with Chuck uh, backstage and when we were driving around and us guys are just guys, right? And we start kidding and you know, I don't want to say mock at each other, because you never like to think that guys mock each at each other. But, you know, you can see Elijah having that spirit where he's making fun of these guys. You know, so I like this guy, Elijah. And he said, cry louder, for he is a God. Maybe he's, ta he's talking, or he's hunt hunting, or he's journeying, possibly asleep, and needs, needs to wake him up. 
Maybe your God fell asleep. That's a sad thing. I don't want my God to fall asleep to you. What does the Bible tell tells us about our God? He never what? He never slumbers. He never sleeps. He doesn't get a break. He's always paid attention of us. Isn't that really wonderful? He looks over us 24 hours a day. There's not a moment, there's not a time that he's not careful and concerned about you. I remember when our baby daughter, Amy, well, I mean, our, not, she's not baby now, but when she was born and we brought her home from the hospital, us being young parents like all of us were, we loved our, our daughter. And, and, and me said, we put her out of, out of the couch. We had a little bassinet next to it, and Amy was sleeping next to her. And, and where do you think dad was sleeping? I think I put my head right underneath the bassinet so I could hear her sleep all night or so because I wanted to look over her. Well, of course, I didn't do it last very long because I went right to sleep. And, and my wife took over watching over her. But, but God watches over you. He doesn't fall asleep. He's concerned about him. And he's, he, so he's cried out the louder. It goes on and, and cut themselves with knives and lances until blood was gushing out of them. Can you picture this? They were cutting themselves, doing everything they could. And then, of course, the time had come for the evening prayer and Elijah, in effect, was saying, okay, fellas, you've had your chance. Now, this is what I'd like you to do. He says, I'd like you to take my sacrifice and drench it with water. Pour a bunch of water over it. Not only does it fill the sacrifice, but it fills the, the trenches round about it. And then Elijah's pray, prays. He prayers, prays here, verse 36. Drop down to verse 36. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Jehovah God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear, prayer, hear me, and let uh, that this people may know that you are Jehovah God and that you have turned their hearts back again. Beautiful prayer. Simple prayer. Is it, really, is it really long like we sometimes think that we need to pray? You know, some of the greatest prayers in the Bible are quite short. When you go through Psalm 119, the longest psalm in the Bible, uh, the, the guy in Psalm 119 is praying all the time. You know how he prays? He kind of prays like I do. I don't know. How about you? Lord, help. I'm stuck again. Lord, would you bless that? You know, it's just kind of boom, quick prayers. Elijah just had a, a, a really quiet confidence in God. He says, you're the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You took care of them. This is no big deal for you. And his faith in God and his prayer is what you see. That God, he says, you spoke to me. This is what you've told me to do. Then for, notice verse 38 and the answer of God. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the bird sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust. And he licked up the waters that was in the trench. Oh, my. There's a large crowd out there. There's 450 prophets of Baal. There's all these people that are in the valley of decision. They don't know what's going on. And all of a sudden, can you imagine if you saw that, you would go fall over backwards. At least I would have at this point. And what was the result of verse 39? And when, the peop when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces. And he said, Jehovah, he is God. Jehovah, he is God. What do you suppose it will take to convince us that Jehovah is God? What is it going to convince our neighbors to know that Jehovah is God? What is it going to take to convince our nation that Jehovah is God? I thought, you know, we think of some calamity or disaster will do it. Over the past years, we've, you know, as a nation, we've gone through calamities and disasters we've had our, our tsunamis we've had our hurricanes and god forbid that we never ever experienced 9 11 again we had tremendous disasters within our countries and then within people's personal lives 
You would think they would cry out and say, God, you're our Jehovah. I'm going to honor you and serve you. But unfortunately, they say it for the day. They say it for the day as they need God's help for the moment. But as days and weeks turn, go down the road, before they know it, they return back to the gods they seek to serve, to their gods of Baal. I think Joshua said it right. He says, choose you this day whom you should serve. It's a daily choice. You know, when, I, when we opened up, I said that the nation and individuals, we all have trouble with making decisions. It's a choice, isn't it? It's a choice to, com- to obey God's word and to do God's word or, or to not to do it. It's a daily choice that I need to make. Let me give you a simple solution. If you come to a place where you need to make a, a choice, it's out of the book of Proverbs where you guys know it. It says, commit your ways unto the Lord. That's an easy one, isn't it? He says, in all thy ways acknowledge him. And so the first thing that I do in prayer is I commit a situation. I commit the decision in, in to, under the Lord. As Peter says, I cast my cares upon him because he cares for me. As I truly commit it to him. And I wait on his answer. I wait on his direction. He says, in all thy ways acknowledge him. It goes on and tells us. And everything that I do is say, Lord, what would you have me to do? Well, how you would have me to, you know, act in this situation. I have a difficulty with a friend or a neighbor. You know, what, do you, what would you have me to say to him? I wait upon God. I wait for him to speak to my heart and to direct me. A friend of ours many, many years ago, I mentioned this a few weeks ago. His name's Jeff Johnson. He's up at Calvary Chapel Downing. When they were first building their building, I was over there I believe their building used to be a white front store. If you remember what a white front department store is, you're very old like me. (laughs) But as they took it over, you go walking into this room, and there were all these blueprints plastered on the wall of the remodel. I go, that's very interesting. Why Why do they have it up there? And I was walking along with one of the assistant pastors, and they said, well, when Jeff comes through, he likes to stop and pray. Lord, what color of wall do you want this painted? Lord, where, do you want this door here? You know, what about the curtains? What should we do? The children's room, is this okay here? That's what it means to commit your ways unto the Lord, not to have a, just a simple cup of coffee with Jesus in the morning, but even though I think that's very important because I have that every day. But every issue that you come up to, that's the value of decision. Who are you going to choose to follow? Unfortunately, you know, as you look at the postscripts, this door today, the nation of Israel, even though that they saw this tremendous demonstration of God's power, you think not only would they repent, you think their lives would be changed, And you would think that this nation would once again join with Judah to represent God to the world. But it wasn't very many years later that Nebuchadnezzar and his army come uh, uh, marching down to take them into uh, bondage, to take them away into captivity. Why? Because they chose not to believe God's word. They chose not to follow him. As you walk out of this, the doors of this chapel today, we too have a make, we need to make a choice each and every day. Are we going to serve Jesus Christ? Are we going to serve the gods of Baal, which is ultimately Satan? You know, we need to make those our own deliberate choice who we're going to serve. Let me t- leave this with this final thought and. And maybe we can get them to come up and share another song with us when we finish, if you have it in you. We love you guys singing. Um, You know, as you make the choice to follow God, I want to give you a guarantee. You'll never regret it. God will bless you far greater than what the world has to offer. Make a choice. It, even as Jesus says, what is a profit of man to gain the whole world? What if you got everything that the world has to offer and then you lose your own soul? 
What does the world really have to offer? I think the problem so often we have, we think that the world has something to offer that God doesn't have. I believe that if we serve the Jesus Christ, our lives will be blessed. Amen.